We have been looking at the subject of the term beloved that Peter uses in 2 Peter 3. The root form of the word <coughs> beloved is that Greek word agape. It's agapetos and that is translated beloved. But the root of it is that word agape, which is translated love. It's found four times in 2 Peter 3. And it certainly indicates Peter's love toward these brethren was an overflowing love. He reminds them, well first, his beloved that he used is to be mindful. They were to remember certain truths and be mindful of certain great truths of God's word. His second term in verse 8 is, Beloved, be not ignorant. There is that need for us, for them, not to be ignorant. Um, someone who is ignorant is very simply someone who does not know. They don't have that knowledge. It might be simply that they've never studied it. It has nothing to do with the capability of knowing, but simply the lack of knowing for whatever reason. They did not need to be ignorant concerning certain matters because those matters that God had revealed to us, we should not be ignorant concerning them. And especially of God's nature, that God is truthful, he's faithful, and thus, Within the immediate context, he's going to fulfill his promise. It, time doesn't make any difference, whether it be one day, whether it be a thousand years. God will fulfill his promise. Not dealing with the idea that God, uh, uh, here of the eternality of God, that God is not limited by time, but that time does not matter in relationship when God makes a promise, he's still going to fulfill it. And that's the hope that we can have. And thus, we don't need to be ignorant concerning those things, those matters. But it does take work, it takes effort on our part for us not to be ignorant. And if we are ignorant, then we will be destroyed. Hosea 4 and verse 6, along with other passages. <clears throat> Then we skip down to verse 14, and we come to the third time Peter uses this term. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found in him, or of him, in peace, without spot, and blameless. Here is the idea, be diligent. There's the admonition. This word diligent comes from a Greek word, spudadzo. And it means, as defined by various different ones, putting them kind of together, to make every effort, to work hard, to do all that one can, or one put, to do one's best. Uh, and I like that aspect, to do one's best to, and he added the word to, to do one's best to. Paul used this word earlier, a couple of times in chapter 1. First in verse 10, when he says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. Give diligence, what? to do these things. These things there has reference to adding the Christian graces that he's just gone through, verses uh, 5 through verse 7. You give diligence. You make every effort. You work hard to add these characteristics to your life. And in doing so, you will never fall. You will make your calling and election sure. By the way, if you fail to make every effort to, if you fail to be diligent to do these things, then 
the opposite of that is you will fall. If you add them, you will not fall. If you don't add them, you will fall. And so you put every effort to do your best in adding those Christian graces to your life. Skip down a few verses then in verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. The word endeavor, as is translated in the King James, is this word spudazo that's translated in here in chapter 3 as diligent. I will be diligent. I'll make every effort that after my decease, you'll have these things always in remembrance. Now, how is he doing that? By writing them down for them. So when they now have them, they can go back and they can read and study them so that they would always be in remembrance of these things. Someday I might preach a sermon dealing with remember in 2 Peter. Because it becomes an important word because Peter is saying, I'm writing these things so you'll remember. That's why he's saying here. I'm making every effort that you will remember. Uh, and he tells them, I'm telling you these things so that you will remember even though you already know them. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ is not preaching anything new. Now, it may be new to you because you haven't heard it before, but if it is, if it is actually new, then it's false. These things that we preach should be known already by everyone. I shouldn't be telling you new information when I'm preaching. Now then, I may put it together. I might you know, make a reference to a passage that you might not have thought of in regards to those things. I might give deeper insight into something that you might not have realized before. But if it's new, it's not true. Peter's saying, you know these things, I'm putting you in remembrance of it. That's why he's saying here, I'm writing so that you'll remember these things. We need to remember. Preaching is that of bringing to people's mind that which they already know. Another passage that this word spudazo, diligent, is used is 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, when it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word study is this Greek word spudazo. And he's setting forth, here's God's word, you need to study it. You need to make every effort in working to learn it and to apply it to your life. You need to do the very best that you can toward that uh, aspect. And I, the word study, to do your best, to make that effort. Notice a workman. You just draw a line between those two words. Study a workman. Because it takes effort, it takes work. And he is encouraging, you put every effort forward in working and studying God's word. So you'll know, correctly understand the word of truth. Now in coming back to, since he says, you know, be diligent that you might be found of him in peace without spot and without blemish. And so we start seeing that aspect of being found in him in peace. And in another passage in which this Greek word spudazo, be diligent, is found, is 
is Ephesians 4 and verse 3. It's translated there, endeavoring. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's why I waited in dealing with now peace. We have peace. We're to be found of him in peace. Well, we are to endeavor. We are to be diligent in keeping the bond or the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. After stating that, Paul goes into a, a statement of the seven ones. Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. When we keep that unity, when we are diligent, endeavoring, doing our very best to keep those seven ones, we have unity. When we have unity, then we have the bond of peace. And so when we go back to God's work <coughs> and we start saying we have that seven, those seven ones and that unity that is found within the word of God, the result of that then leads to this being found in him in peace or of him in peace. But that peace embraces three aspects. The first is certainly a peace with God. In Romans 5 and verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I add, um, this is one of those places where Martin Luther inserted a word that's not in the original because of his viewpoint to teach his doctrine of faith only, salvation. And so he said, therefore being justified by faith only, we have peace with God. That's not what it says. And you could very argue the idea of peace or faith here, it could be an aspect of the faith, the word of God. It could be the aspect of our personal faith. It might include both from the standpoint of Romans 1 and verse 17, that here is, uh, that therein, that is the gospel, it comes from faith to faith. It is out of faith into faith. That is, from the word of God to our personal faith. Through both of those aspects, that's why I say it might include both, comes salvation, comes peace with God. God's word gives faith and thus peace with God. That's, again, Ephesians 4th chapter and verse 3. Endeavoring to keep that unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And so here's peace from God's word, but also it comes to us, we have faith in God and in God's word, and thus we're justified through that faith. It takes faith on our part, an understanding that God is, that Jesus Christ is his son, that he died for our sins. By the way, in Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, when we're given that great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, believeth what there? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What are we preaching? We're preaching the gospel. What's the belief? It's belief in the gospel. That gospel system. And if you go to 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, verses 1 through verse 4, we see specifically that gospel is how that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And through that gospel, thus, we're saved. He that believes that gospel, we have to believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again. There's that faith. And when we believe that, 
And since faith comes by the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17, so through the word of God, we come to believe those facts of the gospel, the commands that are associated with those facts, and when we do so, we have peace with God. Matthew's account of the, that great commission would show also the aspect that in that becoming a disciple, we are baptized. It's literally, King James has in, but it should have been translated into. Into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the idea of into, it's the same Greek word as translated for in Acts 2.38, by the way. It is looking forward to, it is literally the idea of coming into a relationship with those divine three. What is it? Through faith. We're justified by faith. We have peace with God. We've come into that relationship with him. In Colossians 1, verse 20 through verse 22, Paul would say then, and hath made peace, or having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, now hath he re reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. He's made peace. How? Through the blood of his cross. Through Christ shedding his blood. What did he do? He reconciled us, or all things, to himself, to God. The idea of reconciliation is the idea of, again, making peace. That here's two parties that were estranged. They were separated. And they are being brought together now to have harmony and peace one with another. That's reconciliation. That's peace that comes through that reconciliation thus. We are reconciled and Christ was reconciling us through the blood of his cross, through the cross. Through the death that he died upon Calvary's tree, the blood that he shed there. We thus have peace with God. This peace comes through our, by our obedience to God's commands. First, in becoming a Christian, and that's what Paul is talking about there in Colossians 1, verse 20 through 23, or 22 that we read, that he's made peace by the blood, or through the blood of his cross, reconciled all things unto himself. That we were enemies with God. We were separated because of sin. And through our obedience to that, those facts of the gospel, the commands that are associated with the gospel, and thus, as Romans 6, 17 and 18 would indicate, that we are obedient to that form of doctrine which was delivered unto us. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. So through that obedience to that form of that doctrine, that gospel of Jesus Christ, how? In being baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. We then are made one with God. We are in unity with him. And we now have peace with him. So in becoming a Christian, by obedience to God's word, we have peace with God. But that peace can only reside with us if we continue to live that Christian life and all that that Christian life embraces. When we separate ourselves from God, then we no longer have that peace. We've separated ourselves from that one, no longer have peace. In fact, in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, when he talks about the fact that they had separated themselves by their sins, he's talking about children of God there. They were the children of Israel, thus God's children. And yet they had, as God's children, separated themselves from God. Why? By their sins. 
And so as we become a Christian, we now have peace with God. But in order to retain that peace with God, we must continue to live the way that God wants us to live. But then also there comes peace with self. Jesus said in John 14 to his apostles, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Here is a peace that Christ is leaving us. And... This peace that he's discussing here at this time is not necessarily peace with God. Now, it's going to come as a result of that. But he's dealing with peace within self. A harmony and a tranquility of mind. As we see the last last sentence of that verse, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. There's the peace that he's talking about. A peace within self that is produces a calm tranquility of heart and mind and thus lifestyle. No wonder Paul would write in Philippians 4 and verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, here's the peace of God. But it's not dealing necessarily with our peace with God. But here's the peace that comes from God. It passes understanding, but it's going to keep your hearts and minds. In other words, it is that inner peace that we have because we are in that right relationship with God. Because we have been obedient to God and His will, I then have peace within my heart, within my life. The reason so many Christians today do not have true peace within their life is because they no longer are in a right relationship with God. When that right relationship with God ceases, then they have no peace with God. They have no harmony. God is no longer keeping their hearts and minds. They're separated from God. Only through continued obedience to his will do we have peace, an inner peace and tranquility that God provides. Then there's also going to be peace with others. Paul in Romans 12th chapter and verse 18 tells us that if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So we have peace with others. Paul, uh, the Hebrew, <coughs> Hebrew writer, would put in Hebrews 12 and verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We follow peace with all men. We as much as is possible. Sometimes it's not possible. But as much as is possible, we live at peace with all men. Why shouldn't we? When you consider the Christian life, and we're not just talking about coming to services. That's yes, our worship to God is a part of the Christian life, but it's a small part in reality. As we leave this building, our relationship with others is to be that of righteousness and godliness. It is... Practicing the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It is being fair and equitable with them. It's doing good to those individuals, blessing them in every way in which we can. And in particular, yes, trying to teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Follow peace with all men. But some people are not going to be able to have peace. They're going to because uh, even as they hated Christ, who was the epitome of that Christianity, they hated him without a cause. So because we're Christians, some people will hate us as well. And so there is an aspect that there's some people you cannot have peace with. They're out to destroy you. They're out to kill you. 
And yes, some of them are out to actually kill us today. But they're out to destroy, they're out to humiliate, they're out to do everything that they can in opposition to you. And thus, Christ is not only the Prince of Peace, but he's also the Lion of the tribe of Israel. As much as is possible with us, though, we live in peace with all men. But then he says in regards to this that we may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. The background of that statement really goes back to this old sacrificial system of the Old Testament. As they would bring an animal to be sacrificed to God, those animals had to be literally without spot and without blemish. If they were spotted in some way, if there was blemish within that animal, it was not acceptable as a sacrifice to God. The fulfillment of it, of those sacrifices, though, was, was seen in Christ. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 19, he talks about that we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. In other words, he was a sinless sacrifice. That's the idea that is being presented to us. He did not have any blemish. He did not have any spot of sin within him. He was a sinless sacrifice that thus could redeem us from sin. Whereas the blood of bulls and goats, even though it had to be a spotless or a, a, an, an animal sacrifice that was without spot and blem, without blemish, the blood of those bulls and goats still could not take away sin. We couldn't offer our own blood as an atonement for our sin because we had sin. It took the sinless sacrifice of someone else, and that is, of course, of Christ. Peter had used these terms, though, <clears throat> without spot and without blemish, or blameless, in the previous chapter as he talked about these false teachers who were libertines, Mockers. Libertines is basically they proclaim liberty. You can do whatever you want to. Live however you want to. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the Gnostics, there was a libertine section of the Gnostics who basically said, it doesn't matter if you commit the vilest of sins, you're still in a right relationship with God. Your spirit is still right with God, even though your body is wicked and sinful and doing all of this evil. The libertines. Notice in 2 Peter 2, verse 13, he says, And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, no, it says, spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They are spots, they are blemishes. And now then he comes into chapter 3, and he tells us that we are to be the opposite of that. He uses the exact same term, except in chapter 2, with the alpha negative, here, without it. They have spot, they have blemish, we are to be no spots, no blemishes. That's what he's saying, a contrast between the two. And these terms, without spot, without blemish thus, is describing someone who has had the cleansing blood of Christ washing away their sins. We are, without any shadow of a doubt, cleansed by the blood of Christ. 1 John 1 and verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son 
cleanseth us from all sin. John, in introducing his book, and in introducing the book, he introduces Jesus Christ. And he says, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's Revelation 1 and verse 5. That here is Jesus Christ washing us from our sins in his blood. And so we are washed, we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's initially seen in the act of baptism as we are baptized in water. That water baptism washes away our sins. That's what Paul, what Paul was told by Ananias in Acts 22 and verse 16. When Ananias sees that Paul is, re, is a believer, he is repentant. And so he says, why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. By the way, the way that you call upon the name of the Lord is not audibly, but is in action. The action is specifically baptism. So in being baptized, you're calling upon the name of the Lord. In order to call upon the name of the Lord, you're being baptized. Thus, here's... In that baptism, though, we are washing away our sins, but the washing away of our sins comes by the blood of Christ. We are taking that blood of Christ and applying it to our lives. In Acts 2 and verse 38, thus, Peter would tell them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. That is, the taking away, the remissing, the forgiveness of your sins. How? In that act of baptism. So here's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes us from our sins, cleanses us. It's seen initially in the act of baptism, but it's seen a continual cleansing as we continue to walk in the light. In 1 John 1, verse 7, we read just a moment ago that if we walk in the light, there is a continuous walking in the light that is seen there. As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sins. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess, and the word confess there is in the same tense as walk and as the same tense as cleanseth. It is a continually confessing our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse, and again that cleanse is the same tense, continues to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here is this one who is a Christian. He's walking in the light, but yet in walking in the light he commits an act of sin. And in that act of sin, he then confesses that sin and God con continues to cleanse him of his sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. In Acts the 8th chapter, as Philip preached to the Samaritans and they obeyed the gospel, were baptized, here's Simon the sorcerer who also obeyed that gospel. He was also baptized in water. But when the apostles come and they were able to lay hands on others and impart to them miraculous powers. Simon wanted that ability to impart miraculous powers. And Peter tells him in Acts 2, starting in verse 21, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right with God, or right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of those things which he has spoken come upon me. What is it? He realized through that severe rebuke by Peter that he had committed sin. He was a Christian, yet he committed sin. He was now separated from God. He's... Peter says, I perceive that you're in the gall of bitterness, the bond of iniquity. So what you need to do? Repent and pray God. And he does so as we see in that last verse in verse 20 that we read, verse 24. Pray God that none of these things come upon me. 
Now then, being without spot and without blemish, our spiritual sacrifices are acceptable unto God. Going back into 1 Peter, in verse five, chapter 2 and verse 5, Peter says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Christ Jesus. Skipping down to verse 9, he says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises, the word praises there could be translated excellencies, of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Here we are now as Christians without spot, without blemish, we're found of God in peace. And we now start offering up spiritual sacrifices that will be acceptable to God through Christ. In Hebrews 13, verses 15 and verse 16, we're told, by him, therefore, let us offer up the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to God, or giving thanks to his name, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. We offer up to God spiritual sacrifices here, the sacrifice of praise but it is a continuous sacrifice of praise to God. It's not just coming on Sunday morning and thinking, I've done my duty. That's all I need to do. No, it is a lifestyle that is offering our sacrifices of praise all the time. We are, as Paul put in Romans 12 and verse 1, to offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice that's wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. Our service to God is a continuous thing. We live a life of service in offering that praise to God on a continual basis. When we separate ourselves from, that, from God and from that cleansing power of Christ, though, we no longer are able to offer up sac those spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. They're going to be rejected by him. Why? Because we're no longer in fellowship with him. We're no longer found of him in peace, without spot and without blemish. Where are you found by God today? Are you found of him in peace? without spot, without blemish? Are you offering up those continual sacrifices of praise to God, the fruit of your lips, doing good, for communicating or having fellowship with? That's the word communicate there, fellowship. Are you found of God with spot and blemish? and thus separated from him and separated from that peace of God that passeth all understanding. If you're in that condition because you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and had the blood of Christ cleanse your sins, then obey that truth this morning in baptism. If you've become a Christian but you're not without spot and, you're without, and you have blemish within your life, even as the Israelites of old, they separated themselves even though they were God's children from God. If you've separated yourself from God because of sin, then repent of your sin even as Simon did so that he can forgive you and thus you can be found in him or of him in peace without spot and without blemish. And you then can on a daily basis Offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God that will be acceptable to him because of our relationship with him. If you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.